Welcome to another edition of Grace Under Pressure, where my guest today is Lindsay Pollock. I'll tell you all about Lindsay in just a minute. Uh, Grace Under Pressure is that show that focuses on what's too often dismissed as the soft stuff, the caring, the commitment, and the compassion we exert toward others. And when you do it from a leadership perspective, you do it to bring people together for common cause, which is something that L Lindsay will talk about um, because she's well versed in this topic. Uh, Lindsay Pollock, welcome to Grace Under Pressure. Thank so, you, John. I'm so happy to be with you. Great. I want to tell folks all about you. Lindsay is a New York Times bestselling author. And that's cool. Very cool and well earned. She's a leading career and workplace expert. She's the author of four career and workplace advice books, including Remix, Multi Generational Workplace, and her newest, Recalculating and Navigate Your Career Through a Changing World of Work. Nothing changing in, in my work world. So it's, I don't know if we have much to talk about, Lindsay. Uh, so, anyway, uh, just trying to be clever here. Uh, you've spoken all over the world to more than 250 different client organizations. Um, you are well published and well, and you uh, also appear on all kinds of media from the Today Show, New York Times, CNN, and NPR. Uh, welcome, Lindsay Pollock. So, so happy to be here. Thank you. And thanks everyone for watching. Great. Well, so um, the big thing on our mind now, uh, everyone in uh, work, is the great resignation. Uh, what's your term for it? <laughs> Well, I have to get my book title in, so I like to call it The Great Recalculation, but I think it's important to not call it The Great Resignation because people are going somewhere. So there's an opportunity for companies to attract good people and good people to find new stuff. So it's not like we're all quitting and there's no movement. It really is about the reshuffle or that reintegration. I like that. So um, since you jumped right in with the book, and I'm, I'm glad you did, and we'll backtrack. So you wrote the book during the pan. Well, we're still in the pandemic, sadly, but during the lockdown, if I will. So um, what are the themes for individuals and organizations? What are the takeaways, uh, Lindsay? So. so I didn't mean to write the book. As you said, I was out there speaking. I really I didn't. It. I know. I have I to be honest about that. It was an accident. I love that I had an author on once to go, I didn't really want to write this book. And then so I wrote another book instead. So anyway, that's I accidentally that's wrote 60,000 words. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it happens sometimes. So basically, I had a, a pretty thriving speaking practice um, going into 2020. And pretty much overnight, it disappeared because people were canceling their events. And we hadn't yet made the move to Zoom and, and virtual. And I was looking out my window in my apartment in New York City, looking at cars, and I just had this feeling of that moment, like when you're driving and you take a wrong turn or you hit traffic and your GPS says recalculating. And I thought the pandemic was like we were all driving and our GPSs kind of all simultaneously around the world said, you can't go the way you thought you were going to go. And when I started to really think about that, because I had a lot of time to think, and I started to talk to people, what I realized is life is never a straight path. Careers are certainly never a straight path. And the people that I admire and the people I wanted to know more about and learn from are the ones who maybe don't just take that in stride, but they pivot all the time. And they're always thinking about that fact that things might not work out the way you want. So when I think about the tips from the book, whether somebody who's watching is a job seeker or a manager or a business owner, it's really about keeping agile and anticipating the fact that not everything is going to go exactly as you planned and kind of finding ways to surround yourself with constant ideas and motion and people importantly that will help you thrive through that because you know you've been doing this a long time too i've never had anyone say to me you know my career was just easy the whole way through everyone was nice and everything worked out and i got every job i applied for and every client said yes there's always going to be challenge, and we have to really be able to prepare for that. No, and I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because um, I think so often we kind of think that, you know, things will go on as they are. And we've had certainly in the 21st century, a lot of wake up calls from 9-11, um, then the war, of course, and then the meltdown of the Great Recession and now. Uh, COVID and uh, then the terrible strife over um, uh, failure of social justice and, you know, and all of the and electoral uh, discount. I mean, and now Ukraine. So um, anything else going on? Uh, <laughs> So, um, and I think that what this has done in, in all seriousness has made us a more resilient um, uh, 
um, population, shall we say. And I, I think that's why books like yours are important, because they help guide us through our times of transition. Right. I appreciate that. And I myself really struggled. I mean, you know, everyone struggled in their own way. But what I was really interested in in writing the book was what do you do on a Tuesday morning at 930 when you're in the middle of that struggle? Right. What do you actually do to move forward? Because we talk a lot about resilience, but, you know, what does that word mean and, and what are the actions? And, and I interviewed a lot of people and they're just two things that's in profile headline, right? very tactical stuff. And that's important. Yeah. But what I realized was I would interview people in very similar situations. For instance, somebody who had taken time out of the workforce during COVID to be with a child at home. And one person would say, I'm never going to get a job. Nobody's ever going to hire me after I took a break. You know, I'm, I'm doomed. And another person in the exact same position would say, I can't wait to get back into the workforce. Everybody's going to want me. I'm so refreshed. I'm really glad I did what I had to do. And it was like the same situation, but a different approach. So that mindset of choosing how to approach something, a lot of that is more in our control than we think. And the second thing is people kept wanting to do these huge things, you know, like I'm going to start a new business. I'm going to get a new job. Sometimes it was the absolute smallest thing that you could do that would help you move forward. So sometimes it's overwhelming to think about quitting your job and starting a business, but maybe you could watch a YouTube video or listen to a podcast that inspired you with an idea. And that 10 minutes is going to move you forward more or is more realistic than thinking you're gonna take a huge leap when times are really tough. So I was really interested in the ideas of mindset and small steps adding up to really big achievement. I, I love that idea of small steps. It, it, it aligns with my philosophy or my perception very often of innovation, which I think innovation is applied creativity. And while we sometimes hear the word innovation and we think the next breakthrough, breakthrough product, whatever it might be, most of innovation is incremental. And so I think what you're talking about is innovating oneself. So would you not? So um, you mentioned the word resilience, a favorite, a favorite of mine. How, what have you learned about resilience in, during our time of pandemic? So Boy, I'm getting really philosophical, John, but to me, resilience, it's really hard. You know, I think we hear that word and people think, oh, resilient people, it's easier for them or something. And it's not. Resilience is simply getting up every day and, and trying again. And I know people who applied for 500 jobs before they got one, particularly people over a certain age, because ageism is so rampant. I know people who, you know, had to network with 200 people before, you know, they got the opportunity they were looking for. And it wasn't easy. So I think it's a really important message to say resilience is getting up every day and doing it. That's why I'm a really big fan of habits and, um, you know, streaks. I, I believe if you do something every day, it's easier than doing it three times a week, et cetera. And doing it on the days when you don't want to, which is why a really big piece of the book, um, I have five rules for recalculators. And the fifth and I think most important is to ask for help, because I think part of resilience is making sure that you have an accountability partner or a friend or a therapist or a coach where you can say, I don't feel like doing it today, but I'm going to do it because I'm going to report into you. So I want to get rid of this idea that resilience is somehow pleasant or easy. It's really hard, but you have to do it anyway. I'm, I'm glad you talked about that because it's been a theme of our show. And I've talked to many folks, um, ex thought leaders such as yourself, but I've also talked to some special forces people from both our U.S. military, but also the um, overseas militaries. And um, and then there's an interesting comment. Um, you may know the work of Eileen McDarg. And I've always said much what you said about resilience. It's a bend, not break. But um, Eileen has this idea uh, about it's a transformation because the world in which you got knocked down in, when you bounce back, it's different. It's adaptation. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad that you talk about, this is a wonderful a coupling when you spoke about have a partner, don't be afraid to ask for help. And that's really good. So uh, kudos to you, Lindsay. <laughs> so. I appreciate that. And, you know, uh, I think part of the pandemic has taught me to be more honest about how hard things have been. I think, you know, as a speaker, as an author, you kind of read the good stuff, right? Or I put the best stuff out and, you know, these are my ideas. But, you know, part of writing Recalculating was to tell my own story that I was very frightened, you know, of what would happen to my business during COVID. And it took a lot yeah. of work to build it back. And it's not easy, but I did it and I'm proud of it. And I want other people to learn from, from you know, some of the pain and suffering.
Right. You know, I'm interesting about the resilience and, and thank you for the candor of you are showing because it's, it ties into this, that when I spoke to the, the special forces folks, um, resilience is something which is taught um, and experienced and they do, you know, it's, it's the combat readiness so that when they come under fire, live fire, all of these things, they have, uh, their fear doesn't go away, but they learn how to manage it. But part of that is the unit cohesion. And we don't have that kind of thing, but I'm glad you talked about the partnership uh, with a, a colleague, a friend, an advisor, a therapist, whoever, or maybe hopefully uh, several people, because then you have your own unit cohesion. And that's very important, Lindsay. So um, it's a good point that you're uh, talking about in our rel recalculation of our lives, so <laughs> which are so important. Um, so, um, and so what's the takeaway for you if they say, what are we going to learn from this uh, pandemic? Uh, so I told you I'd only ask you easy questions. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, remember is... you're being recorded here. Oh, great. <laughs> yeah, live and recorded. Um, so this is the thing. I speak at a lot of companies, and that's the question, right? How are we going to get through this? What's it going to look like on the other side? And if anybody tells you they know the answer to that question, I think they're lying. We have no idea. We've never been through anything like this before. Right. But what I do know is that we will be different. And this is opening up more possibilities. So things like hybrid work. Yeah, maybe what, like 5% of people did that before and now it might be 20%. Perhaps people who you know change jobs and found a new career. To me, the takeaway is when change happens, you have to be willing to accept that things are different. As you said, people are different. So I think where I think we're going is that people are gonna have more options. So in the past, if most jobs were nine to five in person. Now, a lot of jobs I think are still going to be nine to five in person, but not all of them. And if you want to live in Denver, but work for a company in Massachusetts, that will be more possible than it was. And so I think it's kind of increasing the pie of opportunities for people to look for. You still have to job hunt hard. You still have to build a personal brand. You still have to network, but your range of options I think will be bigger. And for employers, their range of possible talent, I think will therefore be bigger. So I don't think all of us are gonna work from home or all of us are gonna start businesses or all of us are gonna live you know, in cities other than where we work, but more of us will. So to me, it's an expansion of options, not a complete shift from black to white, if that makes sense. And there's something else that we don't often talk about, and I'm, I'm remiss in this myself. And we talk about the hybrid workforce, the work from anywhere, wherever it is, and um, that's real. But there are still many more millions who are working five, nine to five or proverbial nine to five um, in an office, or excuse me, not in an office, in a workplace. It's manufacturing, it's healthcare, it's retail, a restaurant, whatever it is. So have you come across, so what are we going to do to improve their quality of life other than <laughs> keep them healthy? <laughs> so have you come across any research or do you explore this at all? I'm I'm, I'm putting you on the spot. So Yeah, no, up. absolutely. This is what I love to do. I mean, first of all, we're seeing a resurgence of, of unions, and I don't think that that's an accident. And, and if you can take the politics out of that conversation, people are looking for alignment with others who want the same working conditions that they do. So I think we've seen unions on the decline in this country, and it's not a surprise that with the pandemic, they're coming back. I think that's one trend. The yeah. second thing is, again, we talked about small steps personally. I think we need to look at small steps overall. So what I say, I was just speaking uh, to law firm partners the other day. And we are, we're in a client service business. There's absolutely no way that we can change everything. And I said, okay, where can you change 5%, right? Where can you add a little bit more flexibility, a little yeah. bit more feedback, a little bit more work-life you know, integration? And so that's where I think, you know, like the, what perfect is the enemy of the good, right? If we try to change everything, we're not going to change anything. So where can we make small incremental improvements that can help everybody? And that's where I think we need to start. You're, you're so right. And the guest that I've had, and I'm pretty sure you know her, uh, Kelly Yost talks exactly that topic. It doesn't have to be an all or nothing proposition. It can be just like you said, a 5% or whatever it is. And so, you know, I'm, I'm thinking here, uh, for example, of nurses. And well before the pandemic, it is was not uncommon for nurses to work three 12-hour shifts or and per week. So, um, so that's a form of quote uh, workplace. You're in the workplace, but it's not nine to five. It's three days a week and 36 hours. So, 
Are there other accommodations for other kinds of business? I don't know, but I think, but I like to think, and this is one thing, and I, and I know you explore this in your work as you're a writer and a thought leader and a thinker. Um, we can, and you said it, we can be flexible. We're creative as individuals, correct? So, Yes. I also think that we probably have been doing this anyway. When you think of the best bosses you ever have, whether you're a nurse or an executive or what have you, they probably said, John, it's okay. You can leave a little early. I know that, you know, your kid plays soccer at four o'clock and, and that's right. fine. Or the nurses who would finagle their schedules by, you know, working out a system with other nurses so that they worked, you know, 10 hour shifts instead of 12 hour shifts. A lot of this was happening anyway. So it's a matter of seeing what actually works and figuring out how to offer people more options. And again, the idea is not to go from a 40 hour work week to zero, right? The idea is not to go from three 12 hour shifts to not working. It's about yeah. those little choices. And I'll, I'll just tell you like anecdotally, I work with a lot of companies, they'll go in and do a focus group with maybe their, their uh, young employees. And they'll give me a list of things they wish would change. And I show the list to the executives and every time the executives say, that's it? That's all <laughs> they want? It's like these little tweaks that people want, it's not, I don't want to work. So I think would that's you, where we need to focus. Would you say that again, please? <laughs> yeah. yes. People tend to want smaller incremental changes. They tend to know basically that they have to work, that they have to get their jobs done to get paid. Everyone kind of understands that. They don't often want a lot, but if you ask, You'll find that out. Don't make assumptions that what people want is not possible. Now I'm going to throw you a curveball because it's a question from okay. one of our uh, longtime uh, listeners, Joe, who said, what destructive force is out there that's mitigating, that's bothering people? And not the, the pandemic itself, but what do you see? Is it selfishness? Is it failure to change or failure to listen? What do you see in, 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 in out there in the, say, the corporate world? So... Uh, I wish I had a, tell me if you have a pithy word for this, but the, the sort of um, lack of acknowledgement that people are human beings. <laughs> so the idea that we work and somehow we say whatever's going on with my family or my health or my mental health or my well-being or even just my mood, I can somehow turn that off and come to work and have that not be part of it. So the fact that we are human and have good days and bad days and, and healthy and non healthy and fights with our families and whatever it is that we can somehow turn that off when we cross the threshold of work, I think is very, very destructive. And not to say that we all can fall apart and talk about our feelings all day at work, but this idea that we can somehow separate with a wall, I think mm -hmm. is very destructive. You know, that's, it's an interesting proposition. And actually, it surprises me now. If you had said this two years ago, I would not have been surprised at all. But since we've been in this pressure cooker of working virtually or hybrid now and connecting in different ways, it almost does surprise me because our worlds have blended. So um, thank you for bursting that assumption. <laughs> well, no, I think it's gotten a lot better. I think it's yeah. gotten a lot better because we had no choice. You know, we were yeah. literally seeing into people's homes. Right. So uh, while it's gotten better, like, oh, you, you said you had a child, but now I see the child, you know, on the screen behind you. <laughs> I think that that is a huge opportunity to not forget that when things go right. a little and bit And this dovetails into your other uh, long-term interest, and it's the multi-generational workplace. Um, I mean, there's not everybody's a young person like me anymore. <laughs> so, uh, so what are the... Um, I think attitude. So is it my uh, my boomer friends, my pals who we should be out of the workplace anyway? Um, so are we the most resistant to change or what are you seeing in that? So we need boomers because we are an aging country. So we absolutely yeah. need boomers. Um, no, so I'm, I'm still time, working. That's okay. I know <laughs> many boomers are. So for the first time in history, we have five generations. It's not just boomers. We have traditionalists working. The president of our country is a traditionalist. Nancy That's Pelosi, true. Warren Buffett. I mean, you know, this generation is still here, a smaller percentage, but here. We have boomers. I'm a Gen Xer in my late 40s. We have millennials and we have Generation Z. And the reason we're an age or a multi-generational workplace is to your point, people are working longer and later into their lives and they're living a lot longer and being able to contribute longer, which is a good thing if people want to keep working. So the challenge is that the way I talk about it 
it's as if each generation is from a different country. So you would sort of know if I sent you to do business in Singapore, you would say, oh, I need to probably tweak a little bit of what I do because it's a different culture. And I think it's the same. We're still human beings. We still want the best. We still want to do business together. So much is com in common. But you would acknowledge that they do things differently, but you wouldn't judge it. You wouldn't say it's better or worse, good or bad, right or wrong. And that's how I think we have to approach the workplace. So to me, um, and I said, Joe asked, you know, what do I think um, builds relationships? I think it's assuming the best intentions. So if you assume that your millennial or Gen Z employees are wearing headphones because they want to get their work done, rather than assuming they're wearing headphones to tune you out, you're making a good assumption about their intentions. If I assume that you are, you know, slow on the technology because it's taking you a little bit longer, not because you're old and, you know, shouldn't be in the workplace, that's assuming the best intentions. So we have to kind of take away this judgment that surrounds the generational conversation and say, we all have value. We need that diversity because our clients and customers and shareholders are from diverse generations. And frankly, if the world just stayed the same, I don't think we'd be happy if we said, oh yeah, our company is exactly the same as it was 50 years ago. Nothing has changed. We need innovation and we need that combination of historical knowledge, right? And then new things. So the reason I titled my third book, The Remix, it's like a remix song. You have the classic and you modernize it. You don't say the classic is wrong or bad or the modern one is better. You say that together they form something really cool. And I think that's where we need to think. Yeah, I love what you just said about, the, yes, and that's great. And what you touched on when we did intergenerational attitudes of um, and the headphone uh, thing, that gets down to the concept of respect, which is in, mm -hmm partial to me and in grace, it's looking at someone with an open heart. So nice. the pejorative thing is, you know, an old guy like me sees a young person wearing headphones and I'm going, this guy's tuning out, you know, <laughs> and you just told me, no, he or she is focusing and that's what it is. So thank you for educating me. <laughs> so, I'll give you another like example. It. During the pandemic, I had a baby boomer boss who was calling her Gen Z employees and leaving the messages and wanting to talk to them and check in on them and they would email her back. And she was really irritated. Like I called them, I left them voicemail messages and then they didn't call me back, they emailed me back. And I said, well, let's assume the best intentions. Why don't you ask them why they did that? And you know what they said? I know she has a lot going on. I didn't want to bother her by making a call. The intention was so pure and good, but mm -hmm. her reaction was based on this assumption that they were doing something wrong. So when you take that away, I think grace again is the perfect word. Great. I mean, grace is that catalyst for the greater good, but it facilitates yeah. us um, able to uh, pass all the, the pass. I'm sorry, <laughs> the concept of pay it forward, but yeah. giving someone else the the respect. I mean, the sense of respect in the workplace is assume, as you said, assume the best intentions instead of letting the pejorative side uh, jump out at you. Not that I ever do that, of course. None of uh, so. us do. No, none of us do that ever. Yeah. Never jump to conclusions. So, um, so do you think, so you have touched on in all the work that you do, and it's a buzzword and it shouldn't be, I don't mean that negatively, but inclusivity. How do we deal with inclusivity in a virtual or hybrid environment? So. Look, I want to acknowledge it's really hard. It's a whole lot easier to mentor people and build relationships when you see them. Like that's just a given. But we do need to offer some flexibility because it's the reality of our world. And I think inclusivity wow. has to be deliberate. It's not going to happen accidentally by this whole fantasy that we all meet at the water cooler and suddenly we're a culture, <laughs> right? I, I'm so annoyed by that vision because yeah. it was never true. I, don't, I haven't been in a work, well, it's been a long time since I've been have water coolers anymore? I feel like everyone water has water like, those machines. Anyway, yeah. um, so to me, inclusivity has to be deliberate. You have to decide. I'm going to be more inclusive. So when you look at your roster of guests for the show, I'm sure you say, you know, have I been diverse in the people I have invited? I'm going to act. I'm not going to wait. Hope it happens by accident. When you have a mm -hmm. meeting, don't say, well, you know, this is who needs to be here. Say, could any junior people benefit from listening in on this? We should include them and let them know that they can listen in. One of my mantras is when in doubt, be more inclusive. Is there someone else you can invite? Is there someone else you can think of? Is there someone else you can consider? But it has to be deliberate. And I think that's the difference is sort of wishing and hoping we're inclusive to when you're virtual. It is extremely hard for a junior person to say, hey, John, can I come to that conference call? It is much 
much easier for the manager to invite the junior person. So I really think the burden of inclusivity is really on leaders. Um, and I think we need to step up to that. I'm wondering, and you do write about mentoring, and we, um, what role would reverse mentoring play in promoting inclusivity? Is there a link, do you think? So, Yeah, reverse mentoring is a younger person giving their thoughts to an older person or a more experienced person. Um, Fabrizio Freda, the CEO of Estee Lauder Companies, uh, one of my clients, he has a reverse mentor. And she is a young Gen Z woman in her early 20s. And she tells him about her experience shopping for makeup, working in the company. And of course, he mentors her as well yeah. because he is a CEO. But yeah. he listens to that and he knows that that has value. And it's not a judgment of, well, I have more experience. Why should I listen to you? It has value. And so to me, I aspire to have what I call a personal board of advisors of all generations. I want to have people who I talk to who mentor me and I mentor. And we share ideas back and forth. And again, it doesn't mean that the mentoring isn't good. It just means I think it can go in all directions. So be inclusive with your network as much as you might be with your business. And I love that idea because the idea of, of a younger person mentoring an older person, and, and, and it really would flow the other way too, is that then the older person would see the value that the young person and say, oh, we need to bring Lindsay to this meeting or Lindsay and her peer group or whatever it is, or um, that's a, a great concept. So um, Lindsay, we are racing through the show. I could go on for another hour with you or more. Um, but we're coming to an end. And as you know, I ask every guest a story about grace. So do you have a story you wish to share with us? So. I do. And I really thought about it. Um, and, and this is what popped into my head. So I went with my gut instinct. Um, I have struggled my whole life with perfectionism. Um, and it is just something I struggle with, always thinking that I have to be perfect and people won't like me if I'm imperfect, et cetera. And so when I wrote my first book, Getting from College to Career, I submitted the manuscript and it is very hard to receive feedback on one's writing, particularly one's first book. And my editor at the time, very gently, and I think with grace, said to me, um, your book is great. You did a really good job. Congratulations. But I have a question for you. He said, have you ever made a mistake? And I said, well, yeah, of course I have. Why? He said, in your book, you come across as perfect. And I know that's not true. And he said, I want you to know people will get more value out of this book if you talk about your fears and your mistakes and your regrets than if you try to be perfect. And I thought it was such a graceful way to basically say, stop being a perfectionist. You know, we know it's not true. But to say it in a way that it wasn't criticizing me, but was saying it's good to be human and people will relate to that. And to this day, when people say they read the book and it spoke to them, they say, thank you for being so honest about your mistakes and your faults and your fears, because that's what really helped me. And so I will just always be grateful for that moment of very kind feedback on something very personal. What a wonderful story. I, I, I love that. And kudos to your editor for knowing how to reach you in a different kind of way. Yeah. What he did to you is show you respect. He treated, uh, perceived with, a, he viewed you respectfully, but with an open heart. And this is the way I'm going to connect with you. And that's what grace is all about. It, it facilitates our ability to connect with one another. And to and from that, as you say, and then I will say an extension. Your interview today, as you have shared your strengths, of course, because of your power of your ideas and stuff. But you've been very candid about. Hey, when the COVID struck, I was upside down, as many of us were. So, kudos to you, my friend. So, thank you, so. and I just love you bringing the word grace into the professional conversation. I really value it. It's a, a wonderful word to to think about. Well, you have uh, you have much to offer us with all four of your books, and and I love your perspective on the workplace and the changing workplace and innovation and how it plays and how we need to be kinder and more connected to one another. So, um, do you have if you have a last minute word of advice that people always pin you down with? What do you like to say? So. Whenever you're in doubt, whenever you're struggling, whenever you are having a bad day, get out of your head and do something. I think we spend so much time wishing and wondering and hoping and worrying. And to me, the antidote to that, pick up the phone, text somebody, read a chapter of a book, do something rather than getting caught in your head. 
Wonderful. Great. Lindsay, how can people find you? So. I am very active on LinkedIn, which is where we are now. So please feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn or my website uh, with all my info about speaking and books is my name, lindsaypollock.com. Great. And we will put that in the web, excuse me, in the notes. Lindsay, you are a terrific guest. It's been a pleasure to have you on. And with that, we'll close out.